From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today, offering up this week's cattle market commentary out of Oklahoma State University, Daryl Peel. He'll comment on the Fed cattle market's attempt to right itself after several weeks of trending lower. Then K-State's Jamie Lynn Farney visits with Sarah Moyer about a producer survey she's conducting on plant toxicity problems that might be turning up in cover crops being grazed for forage. She's hoping that survey information will be useful in developing cover crop selection and management recommendations for grazing purposes. And later, Sarah has this week's 4-H segment. She'll visit with K-State's Andrea Feldkamp about the 4-H Family and Consumer Sciences Judging Contest that took place at the Kansas State Fair. All that here on Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global Food Systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. And for starters, we get into the cattle market scene this time with livestock economist Daryl Peel of Oklahoma State University. As we typically do, Daryl, we'd like to review last week's market action. First of all, the fed cattle trade, again, ill-defined at the tail end of the week, but uh, generally a market that's trying to get its footing under it and to stabilize. And is that how you characterize it? Yeah, I think so. For a couple of weeks now, for sure, it's looked like this fed cattle market is trying to find some footing, you know, coming out of these summer lows. Uh, and we would expect, uh, you know, all else being equal, that we would see this market pick back up a little bit as we go into the fourth quarter. Uh, it's been a, a, a bit of a slow process. You know, fed cattle markets and box beef markets are kind of tied in tandem right now and both kind of struggling the same way. So, uh, you know, I really think it's happening. I think this fed cattle market will put together, uh, you know, a little bit of recovery here, but it's been a slow process. You mentioned boxed beef. You might recap what's happened the past uh, week, noting that it too is trying to find its way forward. It has, you know, on a day-to-day basis, the, uh, you know, the, the choice box beef will be up a, l- a little bit and then off a little bit. It's been kind of a, you know, up and down thing with no real big movements at all in about the last week or 10 days. Again, trying to stabilize, I think, uh, and really position uh, itself for uh, a bit of seasonal recovery as we go into the fourth quarter. What would we normally expect for boxed beef as we would head into the fall in terms of trend? Would it be fair to anticipate this market going higher? You know, it, we actually do. The seasonal pattern for box beef is to move a little bit higher in the fourth quarter. You know, we think of the fourth quarter as, as having a lot of holidays, which are not always real strong beef demand times. But seasonally, we see lower production, lower beef supplies uh, in the fourth quarter of the year as well. So we typically do see the uh, box beef market move a little higher. Uh, and again, in the current environment, that will be a key to the fed cattle market probably also moving a bit higher. But you note a bit higher. We're not talking about a surge to the upside necessarily, are we, typically? No, I don't think we're looking for a huge move up. Um, you know, if we hold in this roughly 105 level for, for live cattle, we'll probably take them back up around 110 to, you know, maybe maybe towards 115. Box beef, uh, kind of the same uh, relative kind of a move uh, as we move forward from here. You are closely tracking, as you usually do, the choice to select spread in the market. You you say that it's unusually narrow right now. What's the story on that? Well, you know, it's not uncommon to have kind of a second low. The, the, the most pronounced seasonal low in choice select spread happens early in the year in February or March, uh, and we had that this year, and then it goes up, but it's become more common to have kind of a second dip down in the, in the late summer time period, and we've done that really uh, in a fairly exaggerated way, and we had one day last week where uh, by just a few pennies, the select price was actually higher than the choice price. Hmm. Uh, now, in the last few days since then, it's widened back out out to oh, roughly a $4 uh, choice select spread. Uh, but, you know, it, it seems to have more of a tendency for, for that weaker choice select spread this year, uh, even though it's kind of a seasonal move, but a bit exaggerated. And the ramifications of that for the market, folks are familiar with that, but you might put that in your own words. 
Well, you know, I, I think there's a couple things going on. We've obviously had very good grading percentages, so we've got a large supply of choice relative to select. And at some point, that actually will weigh on the, on the choice side of the market, uh, weakening that choice box beef. The other thing is if you look at wholesale cuts, uh, you know, we still see relative weakness uh, in, the, uh, in the middle meats, which tends to be where the choice market is, is uh, stronger in, and relative strength in the, uh, in the end meats. And, and then, of course, if you look at the hamburger, market, we've still got a very strong lean trimmings market as well. So uh, that weakness in middle meats is really, I think, what's uh, what's pushed this uh, choice select spread probably down to the levels we've seen. So will it continue to widen from that oddity you mentioned from last week where select actually was priced higher than choice? You know, again, seasonally, we look for that choice select spread to widen back out in the fourth quarter. And, and I think, you know, again, it was a kind of a brief touchdown that was a bit lower than you, than you would expect. I do expect it to widen back out. And, and even though, again, we don't think of the fourth quarter necessarily being a strong beef demand time period, there is more demand for uh, some of the middle meats as we move into cooler weather. Uh, and, you know, when we get towards Christmas and, and New Year's, uh, you know, it won't be too long till we'll be thinking about those prime rib kinds of demands and some of the other middle meats. So we will see some seasonal strength in, in those middle meats as we move into the fourth quarter. All right. Well, one of the more positive aspects of the markets would be on the feeder cattle side, Daryl. We've seen relatively strong prices in September. You look at the Kansas auctions, again, for the most part, were to the upside last week. And this goes against the seasonal pattern, you say. It does. If you look at, you know, whether you look in Kansas or Oklahoma, uh, we're seeing these these feeder cattle prices uh, move a little bit higher, especially on the lighter weight cattle. I think that's directly a function of the good forage conditions we've got now, some some beginnings of, uh, and perhaps a little earlier than usual, demand for stocker cattle for fall and winter grazing. Uh, even though, you know, there are some areas starting to get a little bit dry, we've got awfully good forage conditions. You know, the seasonal pattern is for prices to decline from August into September. September and on into the seasonal low in October. But in the Southern Plains, it really is kind of a race in September. Uh, you can see a lot of variation from one year to the next, where uh, in, in years of, of good early forage conditions, uh, you may well see these prices uh, move, uh, you know, move a little higher or at least hold steady through September uh, because the demand is a little bit ahead of that fall run of calves. And, uh, you know, we'll probably see a little seasonal weakness as we move into October, but perhaps not very much if these forage conditions and this uh, uh, stocker demand remain very strong through the fall. One has to think as the markets work, though, that there will be a cap on these feeders, at least in the respect that the fed cattle market is slogging along here and isn't up to the upside from the profitability standpoint on the feedlot cattle side. Certainly, if you look at the fed cattle recently, uh, the feeder cattle relative to the fed cattle, that would suggest that, yes, there's a limit. It's, it's uh, really uh, taken a lot out of the potential margin at the feedlot level. So that's one factor. And again, the seasonal tendencies are still there and, and the seasonal pressure. Uh, we had a bigger calf crop this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, we know the fall run of calves will, will have a relatively larger supply. So I suspect at the end uh, we'll see that uh, prevail at, with some seasonally lower prices. But again, that may not happen until we get into October. October, uh, as opposed to, you know, the next two or three weeks. All right. Well, Daryl, something else you're tracking, hay supplies, hay production, of course, uh, key feed input for producers, and uh, and how that's trending will be of importance to the bottom line for a number of folks out there. What are you seeing there that uh, catches your attention? Well, you know, obviously, if you look on a national basis, uh, it's a mixed bag. Obviously, we've got huge uh, forage deficits in the northern plains because of the uh, drought and the wildfires. Um, And and so that's one situation here in the southern plains. uh, We've had, uh, again, a very unusually wet, cool August and, and into September forage has, production has continued. And if you look at USDA's earlier estimates on a nationwide basis, they were looking at a, about a 1.6% uh, decrease in total hay production in the country. For Kansas and Oklahoma, it's about the same. Uh, USDA projecting about an 8%, 8 to 8.5% 8 decrease year over year in, uh, in hay production. I, and I'm beginning to wonder if maybe those won't get revised a little bit. I've, I've done some traveling, at least in Oklahoma recently. And uh, again, this late summer forage is, is pretty phenomenal. There's still a lot of hay production going on. I have a feeling when it's all said and done that uh, the hay supplies will be somewhat bigger than USDA had earlier projected just because of the unusual 
unusual conditions we've had here in the late summer. And obviously for most producers that would be a positive. That'll keep hay prices if they need to secure hay supplies well in hand so that uh, that will uh, not put a strain on their bottom line. That's absolutely right. You know, it's it's something that producers, in fact, uh, again, anecdotally in talking to some producers, you know, many of them report they've got really an excess of forage right now, which, uh, you know, some of them may be looking to sell some of that hay, but in any event, it won't be uh, an issue for them in terms of the cost of wintering cattle this year. Well, before we let you go, we need to remind folks that you will be one of the featured presenters this coming Thursday at the 2017 Beef Stocker Field Day here at Kansas State University. What message do you plan on bringing to that audience there? Well, we're going to do an, you know, an overview of the overall cattle market situation. We'll look through those market fundamentals, try to put a perspective on what we can look as we wrap up 2017 and move on into 2018. And additionally, given the theme or the the, uh, the name of this conference, I hope to include some, some discussion of the, the way the current market signals uh, appear to play out for stocker producers specifically looking at uh, this fall and winter grazing period. And once more, if any producer would have a question or simply want to visit with you about these markets you were availing yourself come Thursday at the field day. You bet. I'm looking forward to it. And we're looking forward to having you here in Manhattan again this coming Thursday. Later on in the broadcast, we'll give you that full rundown of the Beef Stocker Field Day agenda coming up later this week. Daryl, thank you, as always, and looking forward to catching up with you here in Manhattan later on. Appreciate your time. You're very welcome. He is Daryl Peel, livestock economist out of Oklahoma State University, with his latest observations on the cattle markets and some of the factors of influence there. You are listening to Agriculture Today. Now, this break, after which we'll hand it over to Sarah Moyer and her guest as they'll talk about a current K-State beef producer survey that's being conducted that'll hopefully uncover important information on cover crop utilization for grazing purposes. That's next, here on the K-State Radio Network. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. I'm Sarah Moyer and we have a survey opportunity for producers out across the state. And here to talk about that survey, we have... K-State Beef Systems Specialist, Jamie Lynn Farney. Good to have you on, Jamie Lynn. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, sir. Let's talk about this opportunity for producers and the benefits of participating in it. What is the basis for this survey? Well, the basis for this survey is myself and a colleague, Mary Dronowski, from the University of Nebraska, We've been doing quite a bit of research looking at annual forages or cover crops for cattle grazing. And as we've been working on this for about the past four or five years, we've noticed that many of these cover crops are nitrate accumulators. And therefore, if you go and test them for nitrate toxicity potential, many of them are off the chart according to our current guidelines. For example, I've tested some forages that have been 18,000 parts per million nitrate. According to our current recommendations, at 9,000 parts per million nitrate, we should be killing cattle left and right. However, we haven't really been observing that in most of our annual forages. So we are asking for input from producers who are grazing or haying annual forages that you fill out this survey to kind of help us determine the usage of annual forages for cattle production what kind of impacts or what you've been seeing in regards to use of annual forages for your cattle. Find out your nitrate toxicity potential, how often your samples have tested high for nitrate, and whether it had any negative consequences, as well as what type of mitigation strategies that you implement. One of the easiest ways is you can go to the K-State Animal Science webpage 
and go to our beef tips. And in our beef tips, you can find the nitrates cover crop survey. Or if you choose to call in, I'd be more than happy to take your responses. It'll take about five minutes total. You can call me at 620-820-6125. Or if you would prefer to have a survey emailed to you, you can contact me once again by phone or email at jkj at ksu.edu, and I can get you a survey. We really are wanting your information because, as Dr. Onowski and I have been discussing, we think that beyond just absolute nitrate value, we believe that a nitrate index might be more applicable for these annual cover crops to help determine a safe product for your cattle to consume that are very high quality. And you've been out at events collecting some responses already here for the past couple months, and many producers have already been sending in responses, but of course, more responses would make a more accurate and more useful tool. What do you foresee as the timeline on when you'd like to have these responses collected by? Oh, we would really love to have all of the information in by the first part of October because then we can use that data to be able to help us generate some funding and research opportunities while we have these annuals over the winter to be able to help answer the question, what should we do if our cover crop tests higher than what is the current nitrate toxicity recommendations? Our current nitrate toxicity recommendations have been generated off of feeding dry haze or corn stalks or sorghum stalks or bolus dosing nitrate to cattle. So our current recommendations, and please make sure you hear this, (laughs) our current recommendations for anything that is a dry forage are very accurate. But prior to turning out on your residues or feeding your annual summer hays like your hay grazer, your millets, etc., please do test those prior to feeding to your cattle. And if they are very high in nitrate, please do some mitigation strategy. Usually the most successful one is diluting it to safe levels. So for your dry forages, our current recommendations, we do believe are very accurate and applicable. However, if you're grazing a green growing forage, that's what this survey and future research is looking at. We're trying to determine what is a better method to be able to determine our nitrate toxicity potential in these annual forages that you are grazing. That is an important discrepancy, and certainly we want to have that straight as producers are making decisions about nitrate levels and their feeds. So with those recommendations currently in mind, what other tips or tricks do you have for producers to be thinking about as they are formulating diets? I guess first off, you know, just kind of give you an overview or help you remember what is nitrate toxicity. The etiology of the disease is it's not actually the nitrate that will cause issues. It's just what we test for. So cattle get a huge bolus of nitrate that goes to their rumen, and the rumen microbes are very able to convert nitrate to nitrite. And those rumen microbes that do that are very efficient at what they do. And so we get a large accumulation of nitrite in the rumen environment. There are, in a perfect world, other rumen microbes that convert nitrite to ammonia. These are a little slower, not quite as efficient. And, you know, one way that we can keep producing more microorganisms or microbes that will convert that nitrite to ammonia is offering a starchy feed to make them more efficient at converting nitrite to ammonia. As long as we can keep that system of converting nitrate to nitrite to ammonia, the animals will be fairly safe. When you get into nitrate toxicity issues is when nitrite becomes really highly accumulated in the rumen and isn't being converted into ammonia, 
That nitrite then gets absorbed into the bloodstream where it binds with the hemoglobin in the blood, forming methemoglobin. And so once those nitrites bind with hemoglobin, it reduces the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. When you reduce oxygen carrying capacity, then you have a lot of metabolic issues. One of the first things that we see is abortions in pregnant animals. They have trouble breathing, get a little bit apoxic, and then potentially death. So that's kind of the etiology of how the disease is. So some of the recommendations to be able to help offset some nitrate toxicity has been, like I mentioned, feeding starch, an energy feed. Dr. Blasey and others have done some research back in central Kansas several years ago that showed that the form of energy must come as a starch instead of, say, an alfalfa. So it's starch specifically that can help with nitrate. In other studies around the country, they found that a little additional sulfur can offset some of the nitrate toxicity issues. Uh, so luckily, a lot of our common supplements for cattle anymore are dry distillers grains or gluten feeds. Both of those are very high in sulfur. Those kind of help with mitigation of nitrate toxicity. The other thing that we very commonly recommend is acclimate your cattle to a higher nitrate diet before turning out. And the concept behind that is you're just priming those rumen microbes you're getting that population built up so that they can handle a higher nitrate diet. Some good reminders for producers and encouraging producers to participate in a survey. Jamie Lynn, any other comments about this survey? It is said to only take about five minutes, so not a big time commitment for producers, but can produce a useful tool here when this data is collected. We really are hoping for as many data points as we can collect because we ideally want to get something turned around very quickly for producers to be able to use in their operation. We currently feel that we don't have a great handle on what our nitrate toxicity potential on these green grazing covers are. And as such, we've had over the past several years guys who have spent time and money establishing a winter annual, for example, that they never grazed because we kept testing for nitrate and according to our current guidelines, our weights were toxic. You can find the link to the online survey by going to the Animal Science website, asi.ksu.edu, finding our beef tips, and the survey is located on beef tips um, up to October 1st. Or you can contact me and do it over the phone at 620-820-6125. Or you can email me and I can send you another copy. You can email me at J is in jump, K is in kick, J is in jump at ksu.edu. Very good. Well, thank you, Jamie Lynn, for coming on and sharing with us today. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Once again, that was... K-State Beef System Specialist Jamie Lynn Farney talking about nitrates in a survey that's ongoing and open to participation for producers. I'm Sarah Moyer, and this is Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you. And now to today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. 
Well, when Tyson Foods announced plans several days ago to build that chicken processing plant near Tonkinoxie in northeast Kansas, most Leavenworth County residents were taken by surprise. The plant is being touted as a jobs producer while also expanding the market for grain and for chicken. Tyson announced it would build a processing plant, a hatchery, and a feed mill near Tonkinoxie and contract with eastern Kansas producers and ranchers to raise chickens. The facility expects to begin production in mid-2019 if it receives the needed zoning and economic development permits. Tyson already employs more than 4,900 people across Kansas. That at five processing facilities, including beef facilities in Emporia and Garden City and other food processing in a pair of plants in Hutchinson and Kansas City. The Tonkinoxie project would be Tyson's first chicken processor in the state, employing as many as 1,600 people. That plant would process about one and a quarter million birds a week. Tyson noted when it announced the facility that it was attracted to eastern Kansas because of the availability of grain and labor. Now, the Kansas Corn Growers Association Association has come out in support of the proposed plant because it's expected to generate demand for feed grains. The association said the plant would increase the demand for Kansas corn by about 175,000 bushels per week or about 9.1 million bushels per year. Tonganoxie Mayor Jason Ward said in a statement last week his city is excited about the announcement. And Leavenworth County Administrator Mike Lawry said in a statement that the County Board of Commissioners supports the project. However, some Leavenworth County residents who talked to DTN said the economic benefits touted are just one part of a bigger story. There are doubts the community can handle an influx of hundreds of new residents to fill the jobs, including concerns about available housing and classroom space. There are also concerns about the impact on local property taxes and on the environment and the expected pounding of country roads from increased truck traffic. Additionally, about 5,000 area residents there have come together in opposition to the plant, citing Tyson's environmental record at other plants across the country as another reason to sound alarm bells. This group calls itself the Citizens Against Project Sunset. That was named after a code word used by county officials to describe the project they were bound by non-disclosure agreements not to discuss publicly. It is common practice, however, for environmental groups to organize protests against such local projects. On tomorrow's broadcast, we will be visiting with K-State Research and Extension poultry specialist Scott Beyer about this proposed poultry plant and its implications. The issue of a five-year sunset period for the North American Free Trade Agreement as part of the renewed negotiations underway with Canada and Mexico continues, with Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross confirming at a summit last week there's an active discussion on that matter. He says the view of those favoring it is that it would force a systematic re-examination of NAFTA every five years. However, Ross acknowledged it's not yet a done deal as far as a U.S. proposal. Canada and Mexico into Indicated they will not back that concept. Canada's ambassador to the U.S., David McNaughton, said that a five-year sunset raises Canadian concerns and should also raise concerns with U.S. businesses that have to make long-term investment decisions. Guillermo Guterres, Mexico's ambassador to the U.S., said that re-examination would introduce economic instability, which would harm industries across all three countries. And the president of the National Pork Producers Council, Ken Mashoff, other pork producers in Washington last week. One of the topics was urging lawmakers to include $150 million per year in the upcoming new farm bill. They want the USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service to move forward on establishing a vaccine bank that would be adequate to protect the pork and beef sectors. Iowa State University estimates that an FMD outbreak would cost the U.S. over $200 billion across the entire agricultural sector and not just the pork industry, including loss production, decreased needs for grains, and other factors. Uh, Currently, the U.S. has only access to enough vaccine to deal with a small localized FMD outbreak. One thing not in the numbers says Mashoff that uh, the fact that governments, the government that is, would be able to sell the vaccine to other countries around the world should we not need it, that would offset some of the cost, he says.
Again, want to remind you of the upcoming K-State Beef Stalker Field Day. It is set for this coming Thursday, September the 21st at the Beef Stalker Unit just northwest of Manhattan. It'll get into the Beef Cattle Outlook, which will feature, of course, Oklahoma State's Daryl Peel, whom you heard from earlier. There'll be a look at early stocking strategies for optimized marketing and a panel discussion on how cover crops have helped producers improve their operations, those among the many topics on the program. It'll get going with registration and coffee at 9.30 Thursday morning. The program itself will start at 10.15. A barbecue lunch is provided. The day ends with an evening social. It's a great program. You don't want to miss it, producers. And for more information on it, including registration still at this late date, you can contact Lois at 785-532-1267, 532-1267 here on the campus. Or go to ksubeef.org for more information on the 2017 K-State Beef Stalker Field Day coming up this Thursday here in Manhattan. Now on to this week's edition of Tree Tales. Here's K-State Forester Charlie Barden. Charlie? Well, autumn is here and with it comes cooler temperatures and the changing color of the landscape. And even though Kansas is not famous for its outstanding fall foliage displays, this should be a good year for the trees to color up. While sugar and red maples are not that common in Kansas, there are several towns that have planted enough of these trees to really put on a show. Hiawatha in northeast Kansas and Baldwin City in the east central part of the state both sponsor festivals in October, time to hit the peak color of these beautiful trees. Also, Highway 69 in eastern Kansas is a designated scenic byway, and the stretch from Lewisburg down to Fort Scott goes through numerous hills and valleys where groves of sugar maples occur naturally, usually on the north-facing slopes. The village and stream named Sugar Creek in this area was named for the maple sugaring industry that was active here in the late 1800s. Several of our more common native species also color up nicely, so look for the bright yellow of our cottonwoods and hackberry and the bright red of the sumac. Both of these species look more striking if they have a dark backdrop of dark green cedars or pines. The prairie grasses have also changed color, and from a distance the hills appear uniform rusty orange, but on closer inspection brilliant purples and other colors are evident, while some sunflowers, goldenrods, and asters are still in bloom. The pin oak, native to the southeastern Kansas lowlands, turn a dark crimson in late October and into November, and the hickories abundant on the hillsides of this region turn a bright yellow. So this year, on your drive to a fall festival or football game, take a few minutes to enjoy our beautiful, unique fall landscape here in Kansas. You've been listening to Tree Tales. I'm Charles Barden, Forest for K-State Research and Extension. Thank you, Charlie. And we'll return shortly with more here on Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. I'm Sarah Moyer, and it's time for our weekly 4-H piece. And this time we will be highlighting the consumer judging skills that are put to the test at the Kansas State Fair, an exciting event, a lot of 4-Hers involved in it, and we're happy to have Andrea Feldkamp on today. She is the 4-H and Family and Consumer Sciences Program Liaison Thanks for coming on today. Well, thanks for having me, Sarah. And I'm excited to share about Family and Consumer Science Judging, or as some folks abbreviated, FCS Judging for short. So consumer judging is a way for members to exhibit their knowledge in different subject matter areas. So we've done Quiz Bowl. We've done question and answer class sessions. Topics range from nutrition, health, safety, and cooking as well as child development in clothing and textiles, and a number of others along the way. Uh, But this year we were focusing on nutrition was what we had our our topic be for the contest. And we also did some reformatting so that participants could try things more in an interactive fashion and offer it more in a team-type format. So they were able to participate as teams of two. So that's pretty neat that there's a teamwork component to the competition and the contest. And as you mentioned, the theme this year being nutrition, 
there were three components, and what were those, and how did the 4-Hers interact there? Sure. So with our teams of two in the different age divisions, we have two age divisions. We have the senior age, which is our 14 to 19-year-old members, and then we have our intermediate age, which is our 9 to 13-year-old members. So want listeners to know that we had a variety of youth participating over the weekend, and what they were able to do was do three different pieces to the contest. So the first piece that they were able to do was what we called a sensory analysis experience, where they were given various sample cups of items that are used for baking. And they had to identify those via visually, or they could touch them, or they could smell them. They could use any of those three senses to combine to determine what it was. Our intermediate members had a word bank, so items were listed there for them to choose from, and our senior members needed to come up with that all on their own. (laughs) So it provided some good discussion and skills, and then we talked about why a particular ingredient might be used in a particular situation over another with different allergies that are becoming more prominent. This helped the youth think through what could be used as a substitution, what the purpose of that ingredient was, and why we would need that in a particular recipe. Lots of practical skills at play, and it goes right into the life skills focus of 4-H, correct? Correct, yeah. We're all about hands-on learning and helping them learn skills that will promote that development and growth down the road. So with that particular activity, the youth really enjoyed that because of the hands-on nature, and it was a lot of fun to see them interact with that. The next piece that we got to do then was what was called Book in a Bag, and they took a children's book that was nutrition-themed. They read the book and had to devise a snack option and a physical activity option. Now, again, the younger members were given some options to choose from for those, and the senior members were a little bit more independent in what they selected to be able to do that. But it helped them come up with different ideas of ways to teach different nutrition concepts, and many teens are babysitting, and so we thought that would be a helpful thing for them to be able to come up with some ideas to do if they were ever in a babysitting situation or a day camp type scenario that they were coming up with activities and age-appropriate experiences for those young kids. In addition to the two different aspects that I've already described, the final aspect that the teams did was an oral presentation. And so together they drew two topics and they selected one of those two to develop a speech on. The seniors spoke for three to five minutes and then the intermediates were two to four minutes and so those were judged and so they had some time to prepare their speeches and then they were able to deliver those before a judge and receive some feedback on it that way. So all three of those pieces combined were what entailed the judging contest this year. And there were groups, these teams that competed, they were from all across the state and came to Hutchinson this past weekend, this last Saturday in fact, How would people go about looking up their local team or maybe a 4-H'er that they knew had competed in this contest? Where can that information be found? All the information can be found on the www.kansas4h.org website. When uh, folks go to that site, they'll see a lime green button, I guess, for lack of a better description, that has state fair results. And so they can click on that. They can search by a youth by last name or first name. They'll just have a lot more first name kids be brought up by that. So last name's probably quicker. Or you can even search by a unit. So they could search by a county unit or a district unit, and it'll bring up results that way. Uh, You can search by class. If they want to look specifically for FCS judging, they can type that information in and get that results to come up as well. Winners of the contest were then recognized later that day, given some recognition at the state fair, correct? Yes, we held a ceremony at 3.30 p.m. to recognize the top three teams in each age division. And then the first place team in each age division has the opportunity to take a family and consumer science related field trip and they'll receive $200 towards that. So they have a year to do that and it can be of their choice. So there was some incentive and some recognition and reward there for students who participated and succeeded in this contest. And once again, this was the Kansas 4-H FCS Judging Contest. 
Nutrition was the theme, and in the future, this theme will be changing and continue to challenge young 4-Hers, correct? Yes. So we're looking ahead to next year. I believe we are probably going to be moving with a health focus. Um, That's something that touches all different program aspects across Kansas and with Extension's Grand Health Challenge. That's one of our initiatives we're focusing on across the entire K-State Research and Extension system. That will likely be the direction that we move for next year to continue to help youth learn about and develop skills in decision-making, problem-solving, and reasoning. This is just one judging contest aspect that Kansas 4-H offers, but all of those judging opportunities, those are the types of skills we're trying to develop in our youth. And, of course, local extension programs will promote and have more information on these contests as they do develop throughout the year. So this just being kind of the pinnacle and the highlight for 4 Hers, a good way to test their knowledge and skills, as you mentioned. Good to have you on, Andrea. Definitely. Thank you. It was a great opportunity to visit with you, Sarah. Once again, that's Andrea Feldkamp, the 4-H and Family and Consumer Sciences Program Liaison here in the state talking about the State Fair contest that just took place last Saturday, September 16th at the Kansas State Fair. And with that, our time is up for today. I'm Sarah Moyer, and you've been listening to Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.